Hello, everybody, and welcome to Open Source in Business, a speaker series that focuses on uh, the role of open source in industry with a very wide lens, everything from what's involved in getting a job all the way to how do you raise VC for your company. And today I'm joined by Martin Mikos. I hope I'm pronouncing your first name right. I, I don't know how the, the Angstrom uh, changes the pronunciation of the A. Uh, Martin, uh, Martin Mikos, uh, former CEO of MySQLAB and currently CEO of HackerOne. Uh, who is going to talk to me about the open source database market, um, how it's evolved from the early days. And, and I'm really hoping that we can dig into uh, why it is that it seems to be database companies that are that are experimenting with open source business models and licensing models in a way that uh, that other other sectors of the industry, like infrastructure, don't seem to have been experimenting as much. Thank you for joining me, Martin. I'm happy to be here, Dave. Looking forward to it. So, so I guess, can I take you back to the early days of MySQL AB? Um, I guess not so early in the kind of 2000, 2003 timeframe. Yeah. Um, so after you joined the company as CEO and after the project uh, relicensed to GPL and LGPL for the library in 2000, I think it was. Um, I know that Monty and David Axmark were there for a long time before that, but when you came to the company, yeah. what was the, like what was your, your primary, business model at the time and, and how did open source play into the success of the project particularly i mean there was that phase from 95 to 99 2000 where really mysql took over from msql as the as the default free database it did uh, yes it was it was msql that was the 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 forerunner and then mysql tried to outcompete them and succeeded in it and lived off at the time licensing fees and consulting and such there's even an email from the founders where they say, uh, we can even share the source code with you if you promise never to show it to anybody else. Or <laughs> <laughs> but but they shifted and, and in the summer of 2000, before I joined, uh, they shifted to the GPL license to, and sales dropped to a fifth of what it had been before, but then it started growing faster. But it, it was a, a brave decision to do. And the main impetus for the decision was that Back then, if you wanted to do something in open source, you had to be on the distros, the Linux distros. And to be accepted in Red Hat and SUSE, who are the leading distros at the time, you had to be licensed under an, an OSI-approved license. And GPL was the most common and popular one back then. So they picked GPL to be able to be part of the, of the distros, which then immediately happened. And at that point, also, the business model transitioned it into what's called dual licensing, uh, a model that was originally uh, pioneered by GhostScript, uh, which was an, another company that had come up with this idea. And, and MySQL took the same idea. And it's a very simple idea. It says, of course, everything should be open. And if you agree to sharing everything you produce completely openly, then you could use our product as well. And we all share and share alike. But if you, as the customer or user of our product, if you feel a reason to keep your software closed, then you have to pay us for the right to close our software too. But if you, if you operate in the fully free and open source software world, then there are no licensing fees needed. You can do whatever you like. But the moment you close something, you have to obtain a separate, a dual license, a separate license from us to do the same with MySQL. So that was the business model from essentially 2000 up to 2005, six, seven. It sort of then started changing, but it was the, the, the main business model. Did you have at the time any contributors who weren't working for MySQL AB who were working on the database engine? And how did they take the move to dual licensing and relicensing their changes under a proprietary license if you did? Yeah, the, it was never a huge problem. So initially, uh, most of the product was written by the founder and a few other people who were employed by the company. So there wasn't there were never that many contributions, but there were contributions. And we always asked them to sign over copyright to us for the contributions they made. And in return, we would take responsibility for maintaining them. And it was commonly accepted. If somebody didn't want to do that, we said, fine, you don't have to contribute it. There were some cases where we paid for it. Like we, uh, there was a, a brilliant developer who had developed a JDBC driver for 
MySQL and we acquired the whole software and hired him. So in a way he got a compensation for doing it. Uh, but but the, the number of contributors was never very large and it, it just sort of wasn't, wasn't really an issue. I, I do remember at the time, obviously the other big open source database is Postgres. And at the time, uh, installing Postgres was a very similar installation of first time user experience to what you had with Oracle or Informix or any of the RDB2 or any of the other databases that yeah. were popular at the time. It was kind of cumbersome. There was typically a DBA that managed the database, as, as I recall. And MySQL was one of the first projects. I mean, you weren't acid. Uh, you didn't have that, you know, uh, atomicity. Uh, I can't remember what the four letters are, but the, the ac yeah. acid nature of databases. Yeah. Um, but uh, you were it was a super easy first time install and and the database files were yeah. just sitting on the file file system you didn't have to configure a file system for it and whatnot yeah. um do you think that that ease of use and first time adoption was really what what led to mysql really taking over as the default open source database in in a lot of these web applications and things like that well i think in general when it, whatever you do in life or in business to win, you have to win on. You have to be excellent in many different dimensions, and if you fail on even one of them, you may lose. Uh, so there isn't just one secret to, to success. There's a thousand things you must get really right. But you are right. It was one of the early. Uh, the reasons why adoption took off so well was that it was so effortless for users, and we made. We always said it needs to be. We had a 15-minute rule. Now, 15 minutes sounds like a long time, but back then. We said in 15 minutes, you should be able to download, install, and get going with MySQL. And that was unheard of because databases took days to install back then. And we made sure you could do it in 15 minutes. Today, of course, you spin up a container somewhere and you, you probably do it in tens of milliseconds. But back then, 15 minutes was completely revolutionary. But we did other things as well that nobody else was doing. And it's not just Postgres. All the other databases missed that train. They didn't see what the web would bring, a web database where you didn't charge per user, where uh, the main reason for the database was to serve a website. For instance, we introduced the limit clause that allowed you to browse through a database to 20, 30, 40 items at a time, a thing which back then was seen as a violation of the SQL standard. And we said, we don't care if it is a violation of the SQL standard. People need it when they build websites. I so, wasn't aware of that. I didn't realize that that was yeah. seen as, as, as SQL not compliant. So that's interesting. Well, because some people said that a, a relational set is unordered. So there is no such thing as the first 20. And I said, yeah, but there is. And in practice, there is. So we, we, we did it. But there were many other things. Uh, there was even before I joined, so it wasn't my idea, but a brilliant action to every time somebody sent in a question about MySQL, whoever received the question would immediately update the manual, which was online always, and mm -hmm. respond back and say, it's in the manual. And in that way, the reference manual grew with exactly the answers that people were looking for. And the reference manual became the driver of learning of mysql and the fact that we didn't license it we didn't hide it it was available online on the web you could just google for when when not initially but when google came out you could in a search engine search for the the error codes or something and you'd find the answers it was everything at your fingertips which now is a given and obvious to everybody but back in 99 2000 and then the early 2000 wasn't at all a given and postgres was such a difficult database to install use learn far too complex it had the vacuum command you had to use you had to vacuum the database like why do you have to vacuum a database uh, but you had to do that every now and then and it didn't support replication in the way that it should be done so it couldn't scale out every other database was scaling up we were scaling out and we rode on that enormous growth of the Intel 386 architecture and then the LAMP stack and all of that. It was just all of those things played together that caused this enormous growth of user base for MySQL back then. So you mentioned that when you moved to the GPL um, that you initially lost some sales, uh, but you grew in, in adoption. Uh, do you feel like, um, like what, to what extent was the fact that you were open source kind of key to that adoption? 
And did you ever have any issue or, or uh, concerns about um, trying to sell proprietary licenses to that open source community, uh, open source adoption community? I mean, I know there's- the, It was the biggest thing back then. Like today, what we're discussing now is, has become irrelevant. It doesn't matter anymore. But back then, licensing mattered, business model mattered, and we were the pioneers. So we were the experts on open source business models in the whole world. And, and of course, we made a lot of mistakes as we developed it, but we also figured it out. And we, we figured out the business model that would work with everybody. And that's when we learned, and, and I coined this saying that we, there are some people who will spend any amount of time in order to save money, and others who will spend money in order to save time. And that's our community. The, the user community, we should never try to sell to because they are just trying to save money, but the customers are trying to save time. And to them, we can sell all the things that allow them to sell time, uh, to save time. And then the fact that the database server itself was free and open source software in the middle, it stopped mattering because we had things to sell to those looking for convenience, and we had wonderful source code to give to, to those who were just using it. And mind you, most people never looked at the source code of MySQL. It's not that you needed to look at the source code. It is that you knew you could. It's like, and we, and we explained it by saying the, in your car, how often do you open the hood and look at the engine? Not often. Like many people never do it. But would you buy a car where you can't do it? No. You would never do that. Like you have to know, you must know that if needed, you can go in, you can open the hood and, and do what you need to do with the engine. And 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 it was we learned these things in the early 2000s and the world didn't know it then because it was new. Open source was new. There was just Red Hat bigger than us. Then it was MySQL. Then there was JBoss. And that was it. It was a, a smaller company, but that was the universe of open source business. I remember. I remember. Um, I do. I, 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 I'm curious how, like you mentioned, experimenting quite a bit with with business models. Um, yeah. And I guess one of the things that you want to do is is figure out who are the people who will spend money to save time. Um, so how did you go about segmenting the market? I mean, we're going to get to the open core model and and having yeah. features that yeah. paying customers were interested in paying for. Yeah. But, before before you got to that, how did you uh, how did you go about figuring out? Like, was it all inbound? Uh, was it was it just? It like was it the... was all inbound. We had huge inbound interest, but but I would say that the dual licensing allowed us to sell to tech companies while we were building our presence in the market to start selling to regular enterprise customers. Okay. So we were dreaming of becoming a vendor to the enterprise for the longest time. And the year 2003, we said, this is the year of the enterprise. Well, MySQL still is penetrating the enterprise more and more. So it's still going on. But but we had a great business model to sell to tech companies and get money from them and, and uh, deal flow and revenues while we were building the product and the subscription model and the add-ons that we could then sell to sort of regular enterprises who are not necessarily shipping a product but they just need a database in house so so it worked out quite well but but i see still today even though the world is completely different from 20 years ago many b2b tech companies have the same challenge they start by selling to a group of progressive tech companies who love what they do and from there they have to migrate over to learn how to sell to the less progressive, the sort of the regular mainstream uh, customers. And at HackerOne now, we are that, that phase. We have grown enormously in the last five years. Every tech company is our customer practically. And now we are selling to financial services and government and car manufacturers and insurance companies. And we are going through a similar uh, maturation or sort of expansion from the tech world to the, to the broader uh, corporate world, now and been... we did we did that at MySQL back then. And most companies go through it. Like you could look at any any tech company, and they they go like New Relic, App Dynamics, whichever they go through that same transition. It's been something of a theme in this series as people talking about you know the IT companies, the software product companies have you know open source is now more or less one. Um, but outside of IT, more, not less, just more. <laughs> well, I mean, there's an argument to be had there about whether user freedom 
is is something that's uh, that's winning in the case of you know that i agree with and that is that is a sad state of affairs that open source software has won but user freedom hasn't won as much as open source software i agree that it is a it's a long term worry of mine that that we somehow haven't defended the basic freedoms strongly enough like the sovereignty of every actor on the internet privacy security safety we have a lot to do there but fortunately open source software which supports it is doing very well so we have a role model but we have in the it industry but in other industries like healthcare government um fsi telco uh, they're just at the start of that journey they're still you know starting that journey trying to figure out how to purchase uh solutions that are based on open source software in a way that it gives them the the kind of the SLA that they're used to from their traditional suppliers. So even sure. though, sure. even though I think we're seeing that same maturation evolution um, yeah. for open source as a, as a whole as well. Yeah, yeah. So were there ever, ever any conversations around that time um, about adoption of the open source database being seen as as lost sales or lost revenue? Was that a concern that was raised? What do you mean? What do you Inside mean? MySQL, that uh, like that period of you know two thousand three, two thousand five, yeah, um, where you know the company had a had a had a drive to to grow. Uh, yeah. You know that was that was the time when you'd already taken a couple of rounds of VC, I believe. Yeah. Um, was there any ever any concern that the the popularity of the software as a like the free users of the software were what what you might call the freeloader effect that this was people who were Benefiting from the work without without giving without giving money back, where that there was a concern that it was lost sales. Oh, that way, sure. Like some people will say so. Like some sales reps are like, "Why are there all these people who pay nothing?" But but at the core of the company, we had made a commitment. We had picked the license we liked, and then you live with it. Like the you choose your own license. If you don't like the open source model, don't choose such a license, but we did. Right. And we intentionally wanted everybody to use it because that gave us powers that were far larger than Oracle's powers. Like I remember when there was a time when Oracle had 50,000 employees and we had 50,000 downloads every day. And I said, look at them. They have 50,000 people who drag their feet as they walk to work. They, they must be paid a salary and they don't necessarily are they are not necessarily motivated and passionate about what they do they just hang in there because they need a salary we get 50000 new people every day full of passion drive uh, voluntary power to do amazing things and we get 50000 of them every single day so the power of our community was far larger than the power of the whole employee base of Oracle, which at the time was the sort of the, the Goliath that we were the David to. It's, it's and, interesting competing with a big company like Oracle. How did you like, did you position yourself in your marketing communications as the, the alternative to Oracle, the, the plucky upstart, yeah. the, the, the yeah, innovators, the, the, like the, the disruptor? Or, yeah. or did you try and say, you know, if we focus on Oracle, then people we're in a different market segment. Did you try and fly under the radar? Well, no. So there's a little bit like people, we easily say that we competed against Oracle. We didn't. We were just positioning against them. And we knew that we were building a web database, essentially. And Oracle's database is not a web database. So the use cases are completely different. But everybody loved to hate Oracle at the time. And they, they loved to love us. So we rode on that juxtaposition and played ourselves against Oracle every single moment, although we never competed with them for real. Like here and there a little bit, but there were other com other database companies that we outcompeted royally. Uh, but being the chosen David against the Goliath was exactly the right constellation for us because it served us every single time. I would even argue that it was good for Oracle because although they it we made them look silly, uh, also when the press wrote about nothing but MySQL versus Oracle, the benefit was that IBM and Microsoft got no mention at all. So if people say, oh, there's Oracle or, or MySQL, I have to make a choice, many will still choose Oracle, and Oracle was happy. It would have been worse for them if somebody would have said, you can choose Oracle or DB2 or SQL Server. 
which which were the real alternatives. So so this was, if I may say so myself, a masterful play of of emotions and branding and positioning and an act of boxing above your weight and going up and being uh, loved by the audience because you have the the guts to go up against something so big. Mm. But in reality, the use cases we sold to, like Wikipedia runs on MySQL, Facebook runs on MySQL, Google ran on MySQL, Oracle could never have powered them, never. There's no way you could build such uh, hugely scaling web properties on an Oracle database. It just doesn't lend itself to it, but MySQL did. So so technically our, our use cases were very different, but it, it was a wonderful marketing uh, thing to always pick a fight with Oracle. <laughs> I do want to challenge you on something you said, which is you pick a license yes. and you stick with it. Uh, but in 2004, you did change the license of the, the client and the libsql, lib by mysql, the yeah. client library, right. um, yeah. from lgpl to gpl, was yeah. that to yes. um, create leverage for people who were who were creating applications that were connecting to a database to say, you know, this is actually part of your solution, and you need to you need to either open source your code if it's just connecting to a mysql database. Um, yeah, we we wanted to re remove any legal ambiguity. And, and we always were, and MySQL continues to be, fully committed to free and open source software. So the database is available as GPL license. You can take it, use it, all those things. But we also felt that it's, we very strongly felt or believed in this share and share alike principle, that if we are sharing with you, you also better share. And this was a way of making sure that nobody could argue about it. We. We think that it didn't change the practical matters much because, because uh, our legal advice was that the outcome would have been the same anyhow. But it was a way of removing uh, a point of contention or removing a point of ambiguity. And of course, we also said, if somebody doesn't like it, they can take the previous libmysql and fork it and maintain it under LGPL or write a new one. Like, the world is open. You can write any software you like. You can write a storage engine for MySQL. You can write the JDBC driver. Write whatever you like. If and I believe that ended up happening, right? Is, is that libmysql lgpl was was? Uh, I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. It's it's but one it's, of the fundamental rights of free and open source software is the right to fork, and hmm. it rarely produces any meaningful results other than reminding everybody that the right exists there. But there was also some controversy at the time because there were um, BSD or Apache projects that were using MySQL, and all of a sudden they were linking to a, a GPL library, which was incompatible with the license of their yeah, project. So you had if, you op if you operate in the open source world, of course you have controversy because open source people are very opinionated and very principled. So, And the power of the open source world is that it allows people who vehemently disagree to produce something together. And there's no other model in the world that allows disagreeing factions to actually agree on how to merge code or, right. or create der uh, derivative work. So sure, but we solved them. And we didn't mind controversy. Controversy is, means publicity. We had controversy when we were sued by a US company, when we were a tiny, tiny startup from Scandinavia. And we got sued by a publicly listed US company. And we turned it around. We published every document about the lawsuit. We countersued for GPL infringement, which they had done. Uh, and, and we came out victorious out of that process. And it was the best marketing campaign we ever did. <laughs> so, um, so like when you build a business, you must, you must be relevant. And you must, you must also stand for some things where you can't always please everybody. And then the, the point is not to please everybody. The point is to deal with the detractors in a respectful enough way that everybody else can see it and respect you for that. Like they don't care whether you agree or disagree with somebody, but they do care how you address the issue, whether you are open to discussing it or not. And like we had a situation where uh, SCO, Unix, Santa Cruz operations, which became sort of a dark force for open source. They wanted to license MySQL from us, 
and we were like, ha, huh, should we should we engage with them? And we thought, if they are ready to give us money, and that money is channeled into open source development, we should take the money. So we signed a deal with them. And that was an uproar and a controversy. And I spent probably two weeks on Slashdot responding to hundreds, if not thousands, of angry, angry messages, like, how could MySQL go and partner with somebody who is so evil? But, but once we explained how we had th thought about it, that we are taking money away from that company, they're giving the money to us, we are putting the money into developing GPL code. Isn't that the best use of the money that SCO has? If they would spend it on lawsuits, it could be bad for us. But if they spend it on licensing us, then it's good. And we said, and there are well-intended customers who run on their platform who can't go away from it, and they need MySQL. So why wouldn't we provide it? So anyhow, it, it's it's a long gone story and doesn't matter anymore. But but I've learned in business that there are times where you must just stubbornly follow your principles. And in the moment, you get a lot of headwind, but you come out of it with your integrity intact. Mm -hmm. And people will, if in, even if they don't agree with you, they can respect how you acted. Yeah, there's a, there's a similar kind of dynamic going on around, uh, I guess, uh, selling to certain government entities right now. You know, there's, there's a whole movement in open source about whether ethical... Uh, open source licenses that say you can use this software if you do good things with it are right. open source compliant or should be. Yeah, or, um, yeah it's, it's an interesting area for... There, I would go back to the founding principles of the Free Software Foundation and the GPL license. Like there's controversy maybe around people there, but the thinking that comes out of that is so pure and so clear. And, and we have to stay true to it. If we start sort of becoming moral judges over everybody in the world, then the world will actually get worse. Like uh, at some point we must detach the topics from each other, say our role is to produce great software and put it at the use of everybody. And and if you start judging and moralizing too much, you're creating a neurotic society, which is even worse. I tend to agree and with those, you. I wonder, those, those I wonder are hard. a gener those gener hard generational decisions. point of view because it's something that uh, people who grew up in the 80s and the 70s um, seem to have predominantly, and I'm making broad generalizations, which uh, all broad generaliz generalizations are wrong, including this one. <laughs> but um, or all generalizations are broad. Yes, indeed. Um, but there does seem to be a genera generational difference between people who lived through kind of the end of the Cold War versus people who uh, who grew up post 9-11. Uh, in terms of that view of the world in those black and white terms. Yeah, maybe. Mm. Maybe it could be. Or it's just when you're young, you're an idealist. And when you get older, you're less of, you're more of a pragmatist, I, I would say. Perhaps. Uh, but we have it at HackerOne at times where there are organizations who would like to be our customers. And then some people don't like those customers and say those are immoral or illegal organizations. We shouldn't help them. And that's another tricky question where we we try always to be the doctor, not the judge. We try to operate on all patients, so as so to speak, I mean, help them get healthy and and help software get more secure. Because if software is not secure, it's bad for everybody. So we try not to look at the at who or what the organization is, as long as they are legally incorporated in a country that we can respect. But we've had a, a case where we, uh, where we actually ended the program for a customer on our platform because we found their conduct to be so contradictory to the belief of ethical hacking and having a level playing field and listening to everybody's input. So we we felt it wasn't they weren't true, they weren't authentic in their use of our program because they didn't follow the the foundational principles that underlies ethical hacking. But that those are difficult decisions and it's important, I believe, to be principled in those so that you don't, otherwise you fall prey of like the, the, the emotions of the moment and emotions will change. And something which we find uh, detestable today might be acceptable tomorrow or the other way around. So the, those are tricky questions. But that's what I love about, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent here, but that's what I love about open source software and 
and ethical hacking and these collaborative commonses that exist in the world that they force you to have a moral stance and an ethical stance and they force you to think about fairness and respectful conduct and those things like you can't hide from those questions and i think it makes society better when we are confronted with them because many yeah. people will run away from it and think that they don't have to solve them or be silent when they see something wrong happening and and that's how really bad things happen and we've been increasingly open i think to having those conversations around things like uh uh, gender diversity, um, racial diversity in open source communities. It's been interesting, an interesting time to live in. Um, but I do want to get back to my SQL briefly. Yes, yes. <laughs> Another one of the business case innovations uh, of my SQL after the acquisition of MaxDB was having a, a proprietary database engine. Uh, proprietary, I think, disaster recovery tools were also uh, something yeah. that was proprietary at one point. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of using... Uh, some proprietary features uh, as a as a lever to uh, get more sales, say so using an open core model. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you were, I think, really the first company to explore open core as a as a. I think so. As I a think so. Yes. Um, would you make the same decision again? Absolutely. Yeah. Like th there's a lot of opposition against open core, and just saying those two words makes some people just run away and hate you. And, and I would just recommend everybody to just think conceptually about what it is. Uh, we all know that open source is not a business model. It's a production model, and it also used to be a distribution model, but it's not so much a distribution model anymore. It's a production model. So you must have a business model that you build separately. And when you build those two, whether you call it open core or something else, you have something in your business that's open and something which is available only if you pay. And let take AWS running RDS and Aurora, MySQL code running there uh, at enormous scale, and they're making enormous money on it. But they have a lot of stuff there that is not available for everybody. Like you said, the, the, the various scripts and the deployment configurations and all kinds of tools and and deployment options that they have on the cloud that somebody could say should be open, but they have chosen to keep them for themselves. Although there's inside, there's a open source code, MySQL code that we have written. So that is an open core model, isn't it? Or take any other company that like, you look at Red Hat. They're, they're, how you define the core and what's proprietary and what's not that th there's there are differences there but philosophically i think there are nuances like if you take android what is android it is a gpl licensed operating system isn't it because it's a fork of linux so it's open source it's free and open source software but the android name is not free so if you want to use android as your operating system for your your smartphones, you have to sign a, an agreement with Google. If you just take the code, you can do that, but you can't call it Android. So it's a, well, isn't that in a way an open core model? Yeah, certainly like, using trademark as a lever is 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 another yeah, theme yeah, that we've explored. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so my a, point is that the, the lever can be different things. And we experimented with software tools and utilities and and I'm not saying all of our decisions were useful or smart, but we experimented and arrived at a model that would work. Mm -hmm. And now the world has developed a range of them. So you can say the, the commercial thing or the proprietary, whatever you call it, can be the fact that it's deployed on a cloud, the flag, fact that it's assured, the fact that it's up to date, the fact that it has a certain name or something like that. You could choose of, among all of those. And open core back then was the first place where these things were tried out and experimented. And of course, because it was open source, uh, people were very opinionated. Some hated it, some loved it, some didn't care. Uh, but we knew at MySQL that we can't be loved by everybody. Or we, we said, if, you, if we are loved by everybody, it's just a sign that we are not popular enough. Well, I would, I would argue that there's a spectrum in the open core world. Uh, I would I would say, for example, that you know the example you gave of Android, if the operating system is entirely open source, then it's it's not open core. 
But the Android that you get on your phone includes uh, hardware drivers that are not open source. Right. Exactly. Num- so my question, to, so what, where I come back to as kind of that yeah. dividing line is how useful yeah. as a standalone thing is the open source code? And it's indisputable that MySQL, when it had uh, the, the, uh, the proprietary backend, yeah. was useful. I mean, people were using it as an open source yeah. database for free. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we're very, very happy with um, what was it? InnoDB. No, InnoDB was the proprietary yeah. one. Um, yeah, well, uh, yes, there's a number of them. I, I can't remember what was the name of the. My ISM was the one that we packaged. My ISM was My our I- own. Yeah, non transactional. Um, there were people who were running with My ISM and were very happy, right? Yeah, so it's, exactly. it, it's that Not one, just very one. happy, they were also very successful and very rich. Like, <laughs> I met so many people who said, Thank you, Martin. Thanks to you, I'm a millionaire. And I was like, okay, I'm not a millionaire, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> well, you know, but we, we had we had made the choice, and and we lived by our commitment and our choice. Hmm. So, you, yeah. you know that line from Tim O'Reilly that you should uh, create more value than you capture. I think that's something that the MySQL company definitely did. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I think it is true but for any spectrum industry. where you know there there are open source companies out there. Are companies who have released projects that are open source but are essentially useless. The open source is useless. It's like a teaser for the proprietary product, and that's not yeah. where MySQL came down. Um, and then there's there's another extreme uh, would be where I would put Red Hat, where all of the software is open source, but the value is in the brand, the ecosystem of partners, the certification of the bills. Um, yeah. But. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I'm interested whether uh, you mentioned hosted services. Uh, you know, that's kind of bringing us to where I wanted to to bring you is is in the more recent database driven in the more recent licensing open source licensing driven con- con- controversies. Things like the server side uh, public yeah. license or or the Commons yeah. clause, which was added to a number of open source licenses. Um, it seems to be regularly database companies that are experimenting with these things. And primarily, I guess, because Amazon can run databases as a hosted service quite easily. Um, what's your opinion on, on like, how do you see the com- compete? You mentioned um, Aurora DB and, and, uh, and Amazon's hosted MySQL services. Right. Um, how are those seen by, you know, how do you see those in terms of, um, do you see them as something that grows the market for MySQL as a whole and as such benefits the project? Or do you see them as, as unfair competition? I don't see them as unfair competition because we chose our license and people are abiding by the license. So they're doing what they have a right to do. If if MySQL were still operated as an independent company, if I were still the CEO there, we would be hosting it and we would we had a plan to become a cloud vendor. So I just, like, the only thing we should say is why was AWS the only one who got it? Why did others do it? Anybody could have done it. Even Oracle could have done it. Oracle started owning MySQL, yet didn't provide it as a cloud service for a long time. Mm-hmm. So, but but it's, it is uh, weird or sort of instructive when you look at the MySQL case where I don't know the exact numbers anymore, or and some I have never known. But broadly speaking, if you are Oracle and you own MySQL as you do, when you make one dollar of sales on MySQL, at the same time AWS does ten, and at the same time the fork of MySQL does ten cents. So there are many vendors out there who are building business practices on top of MySQL, and they're revenue rates are orders of magnitude different. Not just slightly different, but orders of magnitude different. So so that's something that didn't exist back when I was at MySQL. The, the world was not that exponentially driven. It was a little bit, but not as much as today. Right. And I think the fact that the world now is so large and there are so many use cases for databases, that the, the thing you asked about, the licensing of open source databases or open source components, it's not a universal uh, life and death question anymore, but it used to be. When Red Hat's distro was the only 
really strong channel to get to people. Everybody had to be on Red Hat's distro and everything became a licensing question and you sort of it structured the world very, very rigidly. Today, everybody has their own little world and the communities are so large that they don't necessarily overlap. So you can be MongoDB and have your license. You can be Neo4j and have your license. You could, every database can have their own license and people don't care that much anymore. You like think? there are these podcasts with open source enthusiasts like you and me, but we're not many. Okay. Maybe we're a few hundred people, maybe a few thousand people, but there's on the order of a hundred million people out there using databases. They don't care about the licensing. They look for the utility and they say, is MongoDB a good product? Can I get it here? Is it inexpensive enough? I'll take it. Or then I'll go to Google Cloud or Azure or AWS. And so the, this whole we had this mania around licensing in the open source world, which was so defining back then and created such camps against each other. It's not like that anymore. Well, I mean, these, this, this last three years with uh, from the creation of the Commons Clause, which was used by, uh, can I remember which project? Um, I don't. Um, <laughs> Redis. Uh, or oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or uh, SSPL, which was created by MongoDB right. and has been yeah. adopted yeah. by Elastic and Greylog, and yeah. Um, yeah. you know these are that licensing issue is coming back up, right? And part of it is in these anti. But, but as local islands in islands, it's here and it's there. It's Redis has its own issue, MongoDB its issue. Uh, really knowledgeable people like you will be aware of all of them, but most people aren't. Most people don't even know. If you ask them what license Redis comes under, most people won't know. And if you say, do you care? They'll say, no, not really. Well, and, do, you think, um, do you think it was a good business decision on the part of, I mean, it's hard to judge the quality of a business decision of a company not having all of the information that went right. into that decision. But uh, do you think, like, do you think long-term adopting a license which makes it harder for cloud companies to deploy your service will be a, a, a positive for Mongo? Or do you think, uh, uh, they will uh, they will end up regretting that decision. I think it will be largely irrelevant. That's my point. It's it's not a key decision anymore. You can do go one way or the other, and what determines your success is something else. Like right. now, it is what is how can you scale? How secure is it? Uh, how easy to use is it? People pay attention to different things, and if somebody pays attention to open source licensing, then I know okay. That person has been around for 20 years. <laughs> well, I would argue, I would argue that one of the things that people pay attention to are can I can I run this as a hosted service on Amazon? That's maybe it's not a thing which is directly the license sure, related. Sure. But, to yeah, but you could you could also count on the invisible hand of cat capitalism. If everybody, if a big group wants to do it, it somehow will happen. The vendor will change the licensing. The vendor will create an exception. Somebody will create a fork or somebody will create a competing product. Like it used to be very hard to build a database engine. It still is hard to build a really good one, but it, it's not impossible anymore to just build one. And there are so many, go to DB engines, the ranking, and you look at how many database engines there are. Yeah, there was like, maybe this world needs ten different database engines, and there's a thousand of them. So, 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 market economies are at work here, and they will overrule the dogma of this or that. And, and that's why point, I think I think uh, yeah. Document DB had re-implemented the Mongo API <clears throat> within weeks or months of of Mongo relicensing to SSPL. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, if if the if 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 a fork is possible, or if a reimplementation, a, a clean room reimplementation of the API, and the API is what's important, or API yeah. compatibility. Um, but it know, might be I, much much more important today with how quickly can you up uh, patch the code if there's a vulnerability. That might be, just as an example, maybe more relevant today than what is the license. So that's why I'm thinking, saying that the the problems we solved 10 to 20 years ago, they have been solved. They are not problems anymore. They are tactical questions. And right. like we discussed so much MongoDB and so brave to use a, a fairer GPL and all of that. And now I realize that it sort of didn't leave a mark in history. 
it may might not even have moved the needle. MongoDB is successful because they have excellent leadership. They have excellent go to market. They know what they're doing. They have a cloud uh, based offering. It's easy to use. It's practical. They have built all the tools, all the whatever needs. They have made it effortless to use it. And that overrides everything else. So where do you think um, that the like where do you think the database market is going now? Do you think you mentioned there are so many open source databases? Do you think we're going to see consolidation around a few that uh, that get like no, hyper no. no, why would we see consolidation? Which we just see some databases disappear because they are not needed. Like there's no need to buy them and, and consolidate them. But well, I mean, that's, I do think market consolidation rather than like adoption consolidation rather than rather than consolidation oh okay buying company yeah. but, like do well we i think that it's here? not the deep it's, it's not that everybody else will be kind of white noise yeah. well we talk about the database market but we haven't had one database market in a long time there was one when i was at mysql nearly every database was a relational database the sql standard ruled and and you stayed within very a very confined space and anything else died like they tried network databases, hierarchical databases, this and that, it just wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, not suddenly, but sort of it felt like suddenly we got the NoSQL movement and then we had streaming databases, Java databases, real-time databases, main memory databases, columnar databases, graph databases. And suddenly the from having just one paradigm of the relational model, we had a dozen paradigms which changed it completely. And then we had the enormous expansion of the digital world so that what was big numbers when I was at MySQL is nothing today. Like we had 15 million users. We're like, whoa, we are the leaders of the world. Nobody has 15 million users. And we were, but today what's 15 million? It's nothing. Like it's one city in China. <laughs> so, so like the world has really changed so much that there's... Unfortunately, little that we learned back then that can be applied as such in this new world. So let's talk a little bit about your your current business, Hacker One. Um, sure. Yeah. What? So first, you know, for people who aren't familiar with it, what does Hacker One do? We crowdsource security. So we bring ethical hackers to hack your software before criminals can do that. We are the immune okay. system of the internet. We are like a vaccine. Let us punch you on your nose because otherwise a criminal will do that. It's better when we do it because we will tell you what we find and you can fix it. So it's an incredibly powerful model where there are lots of, and I mean a million people out there who are ready to try to break into your system. And as a reward, you pay them a bounty. You pay them a thousand dollars or a few thousand dollars. You fix it and you are eternally thankful that you prevented or blocked something that could have been used for a data breach. And uh, the bug hunter is thankful for having learned something, having had an exciting time of trying to break in and breaking and then getting paid for it and making good friends. So so it's uh, just an unbelievable model that will take over the world. And in a way, ethical hacking or hacker part security, whatever you call it, crowdsource security, is to security what open source software is to the software business. The same idea, make a level playing field, open it up, invite everybody to contribute, and then uh, produce outsized results, produce value 10 to 100 times more powerful than any scanner, any traditional pen test, any code testing technique, because an eager hacker on the outside can spot flaws that you could never find yourself and that you could never find with an automated machine or software. So, so were you just in, an were amazing you model. By, um, by the sneakers movie? Of course, this is the sneakers movie. Yeah, it's absolutely the sneakers you know, movie. So but when we mentioned the sneakers movie, which was a great movie, we also mentioned the hackers movie with Angelina Jolie. And what was the meaning of that? Angelina Jolie was the first time we had a female hacker as a heroine on the screen. That's when young women, girls saw it and said, I can be a hacker too. Because the hacker practice had been very, very male dominated for no good reason. But with that movie, a lot of girls and women saw Angelina Jolie and said, 
that's me. I want to be like her. And now we have, it's still very skewed towards men, but we have many, many more female hackers and they are amazing at cybersecurity, of course. Why wouldn't they be? But it takes those those role models. So sure, Sneakers is a great movie, but Hackers has the top mention for that one thing, that it, it helped bring diversity, helped make it a more level playing field. And today we sit here with a million hackers signed up on our platform, at HackerOne's platform. That's more ethical hackers than there are cyber criminals in the whole world. Like take every cyber criminal, every petty criminal, every nation state group, every ATP group, whatever they are, it's not a million. They are maybe 100,000 in total, maybe 200,000, but not more. So we have already, we have a force for good that's many times stronger than the force forces for bad that exist out there. So the, the company is not a software company or, or is, there, is there software at the heart of the company as well? You use such ancient descriptors. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Software is eating the world. Every company is a software company. We deliver value. And the value is essentially derived from 50 quadrillion neurons working out there, meaning the brains of the hackers and their curiosity. And we deliver it to you on a software platform because there's a lot of work that needs to be automated and recorded and analyzed. So there's a lot of software there. There's a little bit of, of special logic to make it happen. There's a little bit of handholding, meaning customer service. Um, and so is it software? I don't know. I think the whole world is going software. So it it is also becoming an irrelevant question. So looking back on the time that you spent as CEO of MySQL and before and after your, your tenure, yeah. are there any decisions with, hind with the benefit of hindsight that you would that you would change? Is there anything <laughs> that, that, uh, that, look, that I'm looking I, back? I, I, have, I have a counter question to you. Is there any CEO who will ever, uh, who has been become successful, who will ever say that something is a regret? Like we have this, <laughs> if we're CEOs, we, we sort of restructure the world to explain why everything was needed and everything happened in the best possible way. Like, of course, I made stupid decisions. Of course, there were things where I should have decided and I didn't decide anything. And it harmed the business. It slowed us down. And it, it like it was probably not the optimal path. But now with such an amazing outcome that everybody is happy with and the MySQL database that still today is the most popular in the whole world, then you say, no, it was all, all happened for a purpose. The mistakes were learning opportunities. The stupid decisions were just to show that we're all human beings and nobody is perfect. And if anybody wants to go and dig in all of that, then so be it and let them do so. But oh, I, I definitely appreciate that you know every decision that's made by anybody in the world is the best decision right. that they're in the, that they can make at that time, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. With with the information I had and the experience I had, the the lived experience I had, I I did the best I could at that time. Uh, right. But if you were advising somebody who were 20 years younger, just started as a CEO of a company in a similar type of, you yeah. know, what what would you advise them not to try? You know, what would you say, you know, we, we tried that, we weren't happy with the results, and you could avoid that one. Yeah. Uh, well, the, I think that the technical questions evolve and change over time, but the ones that are eternal is those dealing with human beings, like, who do you bring onto the bus? Who do you keep on the bus? Who do you ask to step off the bus? And those decisions are the ones that you think about the most afterwards. And you wonder whether you should have made some change sooner or whether you should have go af gone after a different type of people or group of people and uh, whether we should have involved something like that. So I, I can have such contemplations where I think, okay, what if we had done the following and and uh, in in those decisions. So cer certainly there's, there's areas like that. And then fortunately we were crazy enough to have big ambitions all the time. But 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 I could also say that when I said we, we were going to build a cloud-based service of MySQL, it sort of is true, but it wasn't as strong in our minds as it should have been. Like we were acquired by Sun in 2008. We should already have had a full commitment to cloud because we could have seen AWS S3 from 2006 and 
Sun yeah. had a cloud offering, and we sort of said, yeah, yeah, we should do cloud. But maybe we're a little, even we were a little bit slow at realizing that that was the time to develop the offering so that we could have become the, the database service of the whole world. Yeah. Now it became, for the foreseeable future, RDS on AWS, and that's fine. It's working beautifully. But, but I would say that back in 2006, 7, 8, 9, we could have like built that early service and we to yeah yeah so maybe we were like we had it in our thinking uh but maybe we it could have been a stronger determination at the time now it's easy to say afterwards of course back then you were like okay there's cloud and there's mobile and there's all these things like why would cloud become a big thing it, it wasn't obvious back then that cloud would be a big thing but we did see it but we didn't necessarily see it for the huge impact it would have and keeps having like we're we're not even seeing the end of it yet well lest we um you know uh, give the impression that mysql was not successful you were acquired by sun in 2008 2009 Eight. 2008 Eight. for over a billion dollars for a billion dollars exactly a billion dollars exactly yes. a billion dollars which and at the time was a lot of money <laughs> and continues to be uh, successful as a project both through uh, oracle and uh, through all of the the children that it has born in the meantime like uh, maria db and sky db um yeah. uh, i so think you should you should look at the mysql product today and you will see that the the best engineers are still working there and the head of engineering is the same thomas who joined us in 2003 and they've rebuilt the optimizer of the, the database and they've introduced new scalability features at an astonishing rate. So people often think that when you get acquired by a big company, especially if it is Sun or Oracle, that you somehow get killed. That did not happen. It's an amazing story of how they've kept the culture, the, the passion for the database, built it out to be even much, much better than it was back then. That's why it keeps be, it keeps being so popular because it keeps up with the evolution of the world. So I'm hugely proud of of that team. I haven't had anything to do like I haven't been in charge for ten years, no, twelve years, thirteen years. It's thirteen years now, no, twelve. <laughs> and but but they've just kept galloping even faster. So so I think it's a continuous wonderful success story. And of course, I'm very proud that I I spent eight years on it but but just seeing that you can keep a project going through all those turns and changes in ownership and stuff and still you can download mysql it's an amazing database faster than everything else faster than postgres no question about it well thank you for joining me today uh martin Thanks, I, i've got this conversation uh next week i'll be joined by well actually stephen wally will be hosting and he will be joined by guy martin and salona bonewald uh, to talk about the interrelationship between standards bodies and open source. Uh, Guy works for, um, uh, who does he work for? O Oasis, and Silona Bonewald works for the IEEE. Uh, so they both have uh, vast amounts of experience in open source and uh, are now working in standards uh, developments organizations. So they're, they're, I think they're very well placed to have that conversation with us. Yeah. Um, thanks again, Martin, for joining today. and. Uh, I hope to see you uh, soon at a, an in-person event at some point, and, uh, and if not, uh, over the internet. Me too. Thank you, Dave. I really enjoyed it. Goodbye. Cheers.